Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. The Fowler Museum is thrilled to be welcoming visitors back to our galleries, but for now we are continuing to offer our programs virtually. So thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to present today's program as part of our Lunch and Learn series, which offers easily digestible explorations of charismatic objects from around the world. We're so pleased that you've joined us to chew on some sustenance and feed your mind and soul. A line zigzagging across a piece of paper, a contested border, a festering wound, an unbridgeable ravine. Zarina's iconic woodcut print dividing line from 2001 contains a lifetime of history, memory, and dispossession, and is included in the Fowler's current exhibition, The Map in the Territory, 100 Years of Collecting at UCLA. Today, we are joined by Saloni Mather, Chair of the Department of Art History at UCLA, in welcoming Aparna Kumar, who will discuss the importance of this abstracted landscape in the life and practice of Indian-born New York-based artist Zarina, and to our understanding of home and belonging. We'll learn about Zarina's unique attachment to paper and printmaking, her laborious woodcut carving process, her innovations in cartography, and the intimate relationship of dividing line to her experience of the 1947 partition of India and Pakistan. Before we get going, two quick technical bits of housekeeping. Once the screen sharing begins, please uh, don't feel afraid to click view options at the top and select side-by-side -side mode so the video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, you can submit them to the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can submit and upvote questions that you'd like to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's all from me. Over to you, Saloni. Thank you, Bianca. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can Good. hear you. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much, Bianca. It's really a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure for me to have the uh, honor of introducing our speaker today, uh, Aparna Kumar. Aparna is coming to us live from London. So she's uh, definitely um, uh, kind enough to join us at the end of her possibly a long work day. So it's a real pleasure. Aparna Kumar is uh, a lecturer in art and visual cultures of the Global South at the University College London. She received her PhD in art history in 2018 from our department here at UCLA, and I had the privilege of serving as her thesis supervisor. Aparna's doctoral uh, dissertation, which she's now revising for publication uh, as a book, examined the partition of the Indian subcontinent in 1947 and its impact on museums and aesthetic discourses on 20th century India and Pakistan. The thesis was awarded a dissertation prize earlier this year from University of California, Berkeley for dissertation projects related to uh, art and architecture of the South Asian subcontinent. But perhaps most relevant um, in terms of her biography for the talk today, Aparna also completed her MA in art history here at UCLA uh, with a thesis entitled Lines of Inquiry, Partition, Historiography, and the Art of Zarina Hashmi. In other words, her MA thesis from 2012 was entirely about the work of art that Aparna will be addressing today. That is to say, Zarina Hashmi's dividing line. So in other words, we're in for a real treat and I'm utterly delighted to welcome Aparna back to UCLA to speak to our virtual audience today. So thank you, Aparna, please. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, thank you so much, Saloni, for your kind words of introduction and to Bianca and the Fowler Museum for the invitation to speak today on Zarina's dividing line. I'm thrilled to be here because this is a work of art that is very near to my heart. 
it's hard for me to believe, but uh, I have been thinking about dividing line or rather thinking with it for the better part of a decade now. I first encountered the woodcut print as a graduate student at UCLA in 2011 when writing my MA thesis on Zarina's broader printmaking practice and its relationship to partition history in South Asia. Looking back, it was really a fortuitous time to begin this work in Los Angeles as Dividing Line was set to be featured the following year in the Hammer Museum's extraordinary retrospective exhibition on Zarina's life and career, Paper Like Skin, curated by Allegra Pacenti. I still have vivid memories of weaving through this show and seeing the print installed for the first time. It was placed in one of the exhibition's back galleries, juxtaposed next to a selection of Zarina's other cartographic works. After a year of studying Dividing Line in the pages of catalogs and books, I had sufficiently memorized its curves and striations, but remained wholly unprepared for the scale of what its physical impact would have on my person. In that room, Zarina's line swept over me like a wave, searing its fragmentations into my mind, and at no risk of exaggeration, it stayed with me ever since, inflecting my work, my writing, and my worldview. For many reasons then, it's difficult for me to know exactly where to begin our discussion of dividing line today. There are innumerable ways to approach this work and it does not help that the print anticipates this, this paralysis, and even to some extent cultivates it in its viewer. But for the purposes of our discussion today, what I hope will be more of a beginning than an end. I'm gonna try to keep my reflections to three key points. I'll begin with a brief introduction to the print's composition and contestations and provide some key background on the artist. My aim here is to unfold the print's fraught relationship to the 1947 partition of the Indian subcontinent and give you a broader picture of where dividing line falls within the larger corpus of Zarina's artistic practice, a wandering career that spanned over 60 years and three continents. I'll then move into a discussion of Zarina's printmaking process to provide a glimpse of the intimate, tedious, and admittedly violent labor that underlies the making of Dividing Lines ink and paper surface. In my larger project on Zarina, I show that any reading of Dividing Line is incomplete without accounting for the physicality and erasures of its making. I'll end today by offering a few final thoughts on the importance of dividing line for our understanding of partition, what I hope will uh, 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 set off our Q&A session. At first glance, and in the broadest possible terms, dividing line contains an intimate meditation on the act of separation. It shows a thick, black, meandering line incising a flesh-colored surface into haphazard parts. There's more to this line than first meets the eye. This line has no clear beginning or end. It seems to originate somewhere out of frame, beyond the paper surface that contains what may only be a snapshot of its full form and figure. This line is calligraphic, like Zarina's mother tongue of Urdu. It winds across the page with lyricism and purpose, etching a web of solemnity and sorrow with every twist, turn, and crevice of its writhing form. This line is cavernous and dismiss the bounds of its two-dimensionality with ease. It absorbs the light of its paper surface with avarice and delight, and abounds with a frenetic energy that pulls its viewer into and across its interminable form. At times, its inked body feels deep, even topographical. In these moments of texture, it eschews Zarina's titular designation and could just as easily be a dividing trench, a ravine, a cliff, whose nadir remains out of, out of sight or out of reach. This line, if it is a line, is also quite violent. It cuts and carves its surface with the conviction of a surgeon who stitches and sutures in haste and panic. The overall effect is as dizzying as it is staggering. It's messy, chaotic, uncertain, final, and somehow still unfolding. For some, there is familiarity in this disorientation. The print's dark line, or what we know of it, recalls the silhouette of another. 
The Radcliffe Line, the national boundaries drawn in haste across the Indian subcontinent in August 1947. Announced after mere weeks of deliberation, the Radcliffe Line signaled an era of new beginnings in South Asia, in the disintegration of British colonial rule and the arrival of India and Pakistan to the global arena, a territory that spans modern day India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the contested states of Jammu and Kashmir. It also wrought devastation in the form of partition, a painful and intricate process of human, territorial, and cultural disentanglement bounded by genocidal violence and one of the largest mass migrations in human history. Born to a Muslim family in Aligarh, India in 1937, Zarina knew of this line well, having witnessed the partitioning of her homeland at a young age and lived the subsequent upheaval of place, home, and self that accompanied it. It's a line she later described as strange and painful to cross, a border that permanently altered the fabric of life for millions of people and somehow also, quote, didn't really exist. This playful interplay of geometry and geography, so crucial to dividing lines abstracted gut punch, is a hallmark of Zarina's wider artistic practice. It grows in part from the nomadic genealogy of Zarina's artistic training in the mid 20th century. After her marriage to an Indian diplomat in the 1950s, Zarina spent much of her early artistic career traveling between Europe, Asia, and the Indian subcontinent before settling in the United States in the 1970s. Dividing Line is inextricable, for instance, from her time spent in Paris in the 1960s, working as a printmaker under the tutelage of Stanley William Hayter of Atelier 17, where Zarina cultivated her great preference for paper. Dividing Line's abstracted and minimal design speaks to her formative encounter in these same years with the work of such artists as Kazimir Malevich, Konstantin Brancusi, and Piet Mondrian, whose play with abstraction in many ways encouraged Zarina's own turn away from figurative representation. As a woodcut, Dividing Line also bears the profound debt of Zarina's practice to her travels in Japan, where in the 1970s, initially on a Japan Foundation Fellowship, she immersed herself in Japanese printmaking techniques as an apprentice to the Toshi Yoshido studio, began to refine her personal and intuitive approach to the carving of woodblocks, what would become a favored medium of her practice. Dividing Line, however, is perhaps foremost emblematic of Zarina's cartographic turn. By this, I do not just mean her profuse use of maps by the late 20th century, though we'll come back to this in just a moment. I refer more broadly to her use of mapping as an artistic mode of carving to trace, index, and archive the intersections and interrelations of space, memory, language, history, and belonging. Zarina's cartographic turn in this regard intermingles with her explorations of home, a concept rife with instability and loss in her work. In her portfolio of etchings, Homes I Have Made, A Life in Nine Lines, for example, Zarina surveys the various spaces where she lived between 1958 and 1997, as she shifted from Thailand back to India, to France, Germany, and Japan, then to the United States. The portfolio's rudimentary geometry and playful expansion of the floor plan visualizes at once the variability of home, the segmentations of home, the mutability and resilience of home, but also Zarina's exilic sensibility in the years since the partition. It brings to life her endless movement between lines and spaces, and in so doing facilitates her continued uncertainty of home. In her monumental series, Home as a Foreign Place, Zarina's mapping takes the form of excavation. She pairs abstracted shapes and colors with single Urdu words like zameen, sarhad, setare, andera, earth, border, stars, darkness, respectively. These constellations conjure sensorial possibilities of being at home in the wider world, and in the process excavate the exilic contours of her mother tongue, a language increasingly marginalized in contemporary India as a sign of Muslim culture. Here, home is mapped neither as place nor memory of place, but rather as language itself, 
that which travels in spite of place, borders, and divisions. Zarina's later maps crucially evolve these fragilities of home into a broader examination of borders. In these works, borders are both, in, in, her, in these later works, borders are both tangible and intangible, existent and artificial, stagnant, and mobile, event and process. They divide and entangle, cut and suture, pulsate rifts of identitarian possibility alongside chasms of human and cultural devastation. Her series, Atlas of My World, a portfolio of six woodcuts printed in black with Urdu text, documents the borders and boundaries that she crossed in the course of her lifetime. Like Homes I Have Made, it is a beautiful ode to a life of nomadic travel, one that entangles distanced places into new configurations of the world. In equal measure, the portfolio is uncomfortable and anguished. It indexes the lines that shaped her sense of self, her sense of belonging, that she was beholden to and bounded by. Though always also personal, Zarina's maps connect spaces, communities, and histories beyond herself too. Her series, These Cities Blotted into Wilderness, a portfolio of nine woodcuts printed in black with Urdu text, bring together places, many with large Muslim populations, ravaged by bombing, war, and communal violence, histories of imperialism and minoritization. These maps like dividing line are sometimes barely recognizable or difficult to decipher. Zarina renders their urban plans from violent textures that dismantle the distance between them and entwine their grief. It's an archive of the world that explores the quote, foundational unlivability of modes of modern life as Amir Mufti writes and centers the border as problem. To experience dividing line fully, however, is not only to untangle the power and complexity of the print's cartographic gesture, but also to recognize the centrality of Zarina's process to the work's finished form. The violence of Zarina's physical excavation of wood from woodblock as she struggles to give shape to the landscape that becomes dividing line, the violence of erasure as said excavation is at least partially obscured by the transference of ink, and finally, the violence of absence when dividing line at the end of it all stands before the viewer alone and detached from the artist's hand. A woodcut print dividing line is born of a multi-step process that entails among other things, the careful selection of paper, the carving of wood by hand, the inking of the final woodblock plate and the transfer of ink and image from wood to paper surface to create the print's final iteration a process that can be and is designed to be repeated as needed. As you can see in this image here of Zarina's woodblock for dividing line, it's an extremely tedious, violent and repetitive process, one that sees Zarina in intimate collusion with her materials and tools. More interesting still in the case of dividing line is the way the print central line physically comes about. The line is created not through a process of incision, as would perhaps be most instinctive when drawing a line, but through a process of subtraction. Zarina does not carve or incise the line into the woodblock plate. She carves out the space around the line. And where this gouging of wood alone constitutes a powerful cartographic gesture, Zarina does not stop there. She also renders this violence slightly visible within the print in powerful ways by embracing the stray marks of ink, the vestiges of her carving process as part and parcel of the work's final composition. Here, if we return to the detailed views of dividing line surface, you can see how these vestiges of ink converge in and around the line in different rhythms. They mark the different pressure points of Zarina's hands and tools, and even intermingle with the capricious striations organic to the handmade Indian paper. This latter point becomes more apparent when comparing Dividing Line to Atlas of My World 4, the print within the larger Atlas series devoted to the Indian subcontinent. Though both prints are born of the same woodcut process, not to mention the same contested geography, there is a sense in which Atlas of My World 4 is more distant from the fact of its making than the more process-oriented image of Dividing Line. 
tied perhaps to Suzerina's poignant use of Urdu script here, that here serves to differentiate the space of Hindustan or India from Pakistan and harden the Atlas image as a map. There is a certain clarity to Atlas of my world for unmatched by the rough texture of dividing line. And while both prints certainly comment on the Radcliffe line in significant ways, this difference, however slight, in their relationship to Zarina's printmaking process helps to distinguish their divergent propositions. Where Atlas of My World 4 highlights the inefficacy and artificiality of the Radcliffe line, its inability perhaps to ever fully separate India from Pakistan, dividing line is much more about the border at its origins. It lends itself moreover to bodily interpretation as a festering wound, a scar even across flayed flesh. It makes visible, perhaps even performs, the dialectical process of creating this border in perpetuity and opens with it a powerful layering of histories, both personal and communal. The question thus remains, you know, what exactly can we make of Serena's dividing line? On one hand, I see the print as representative of a distinct, vibrant, and changing field of creative energy around partition history in South Asia that in the last two decades, spurred in part by the 50th and 70th anniversaries of Indian and Pakistani independence, has seen artists and curators look back on 1947 in their work to address contemporary social, political, and economic issues. This creative field has had several important ramifications for our understanding of the partition and its legacy of violence and disruption. It has helped to problematize official state narratives of the partition as an event or glitch in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh's otherwise seamless transition from colonial state to post-colonial nations. It has reframed partition instead as an extended process of rupture and trauma. This work has exposed the unprecedented nature of partition violence, namely the lasting crises of history, memory, and representation that accompanied its physical fragmentations. It has also brought into question the solidity of national boundaries, cultures, and identities in South Asia by redefining the Indo-Pakistani-Bangladeshi borders as a lived and unfolding reality that permeates every aspect of the region's infrastructure. Dividing line also, however, stands apart from this creative field, especially in the questions it raises for history and language. For me, one of the most powerful aspects of this work involves a question of time. When did Zarina create this line? The question is not easy to answer. The print was conceptualized in tandem with Atlas of My World, completed sometime in the fall of 2001 around the time frame of the 9-11 tax on New York, Zarina's city of dreams. This is not to say that dividing line was Zarina's direct response to 9-11, but that it becomes deeply entwined with her experiences of New York in the months that followed. 9-11, like the partition, irrevocably changed Zarina's relationship to place, home, and self. It engendered war, violence, imperialism, virulent strands of Islamophobia that dramatically altered the character of her chosen home, not to mention the wider world. Here then, with dividing line, the gouge of Zarina's woodblock becomes a method of writing history. It invites a layering of history and memory across temporalities that makes it possible to read her experiences of dispossession following both 1947 and 9-11 together not in a way that suggests any kind of causality between the two or seeks to reconcile the two, but in a way that certainly uproots the conventions of time and space that structure the historian's craft. Put another way, the power of dividing line resides with its fragmentations, which ask, what might history look like at the limits of place and self? How must language respond? Thank you. Thank you very much, Aparna. That was a really marvelous uh, um, accounting of that very powerful piece. Thank you so much. You've really, it seems to me, um, uh, instructed all of us about why that very 
uh, in many ways, economical and quote, simple piece really mm -hmm. is packing a gut punch as you put it. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much. I, that was really brought home. Um, we don't have that much time, but I do, uh, I'm very happy to see there's uh, almost 100 participants um, viewing right now. And so I'd like to open it up for any uh, questions that you might have for Aparna. Um, and as you are begin thinking about your questions if it, and putting them in the Q&A, um, I can begin with one question that already came in for you, Aparna. Um, and the question is this, do you think Zarina's work about home and belonging is part of a larger generation or movement of artists in the 20th century who lost home or became more mobile? Uh, that's a wonderful question. Yes, absolutely. I think that um, there's a way in which she's speaking to, I think, the larger crises of the 20th century that um, you know, have seen um, various different kinds of not only crises of war, but crises of migration and spe specifically, um, that has seen populations become more mobile by cho choice, but also by force, um, by you know, the demands of circumstances and violence. Um, and so I definitely think that Zarina's work her reflections on home, the way that she destabilizes these concepts of home and belonging are very much in dialogue with those um, broader kind of um, historical changes that we see in the 20th century and that carry over um, into the 21st as we're seeing now. Yeah, thank you. Um, would anybody else like to ask a question of uh, Aparna why we have a few minutes left? If so, please go ahead and put them in the, uh, I'm making sure that I'm not missing any questions here. Um, so Aparna, do you think, I think you're quite right to, to um, reflect on the, um, on Zarina's work and experience um, uh, as kind of uh, emblematic of, of larger aesthetic uh, impulses by other artists, not just uh, unique to South Asia, but around the world. Are there other artists that you think of alongside her work in that regard? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, yes. Um, I think, I mean, honestly, I think that uh, one of the things that Zarina has helped me to think a little bit about is um, uh, well, I mean, not just artists that are working on, I think, and responding to um, questions of partition in South Asia, but this kind of larger question of um, decolonization or what it means to, um, um, uh, you know, what it means to kind of engage in, uh, you know, a, a decolonized space or a fragmented space or a partitioned space. And as we can see, partition was actually not unique to South Asia. It was a concept that traveled and was part of the larger kind of um, logic of decolonization of the British Empire. So it's very much in dialogue with artists that are coming out of Israel and Palestine, that are coming out of Ireland that are coming out of other spaces that um, uh, you know experienced those those kinds of um, uh, fractures as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you. No, I would agree. I think it's precisely what makes uh, us all be able to relate or identify. Uh, in other words, it's part of what is kind of universal about Zarina's dividing yeah. line um, is the way it resonates with other historical experiences of the 20th century. We have a couple more questions. Let me um, pose them for you, Aparna, if I can. Um, could you, want, the first question is, could you talk about the actual shape of the line? Is it yeah. supposed to reflect the Radcliffe line? It's a really great question and, and one that in the larger project I try to think about very deeply because it is a very particular moment. The kind of line that we see in dividing line is a very particular moment in the kind of larger history of that, that border. Um, it reflects um, well, Zarina herself said, you know, she didn't really use maps. It's a line that's kind of etched across her heart. And so she was kind of, you know, using her own memory of this line to create it. Um, if you compare it to kind of historical maps of the Indo-Pakistani border, it, it does align with the quote unquote original Radcliffe line and specifically 
one of two lines that was divided in 1947, that, uh, that divided India and Pakistan in 1947, that corresponds to the northwestern portion of the um, subcontinent. So it doesn't include the portion of the Radcliffe line that would eventually become the Indo-Bangladeshi border. Um, and the one thing, you know, it is an imagined, like, you know, with dealing with, um, uh, dealing with dividing line, it's important to kind of understand that she's dealing with a historical formation, but it's also a kind of imagined line that she's kind of, you know, negotiating, right? Because it also, you know, if you compare it to the Indo-Pakistani border today, it of course does not kind of um, uh, reflect the changes that have come since 1947 with um, uh, the, the, you know, the implementation of the line of control and the various kind of contestations that still affect and shape um, the region of Jammu and Kashmir today. So it's, that's a great question. Thank you, Aparna. Um, I'm mindful of the time, but we have two uh, really great questions that maybe we can end with. Um, one, I'll just read them both to you. One is, um, is Irina's work always done in woodcut? And has she written about its uses? So one is the question of the woodcut in Zarina's practice. And the second question is that it looks like Zarina uses Urdu script in other prints, not just those that depict South Asia. So what do you make of that? In other words, the question uh, at the uh, place of Urdu in her, in her image making. So. Very big question. Thanks for that, Erin. Um, uh, so for the first, the question is, does she always use woodcut? And no, she doesn't use woodcut. She's actually, um, um, she uses, woodcut becomes a primary medium of a lot of her maps. So it's a lot of the works that I have ended up working with. Um, and But she does play around with all different kinds of materials. I think one of the things that the um, uh, Hammer Museum's retrospective exhibition, Paper Like Skin, really helped us think about was actually the primacy of paper for first and foremost in Serena's practice. She uses, she's really interested in different kinds of paper, her choice of paper for her prints, whether they're woodcuts or other kinds of prints, etchings, um, um, is actually, you know, a foremost concern of her practice. She's really interested in the intersections of paper and place. Um, and um, that kind of paper also um, dovetails into kind of paper mache sculptures that we see. She also works in metal. She works in other kinds of found objects across her career. So she's working in uh, definitely a variety of different kinds of materials. Um, and as to the question of Urdu and Zarina's practice, I think one of the, um, uh, the kinds of uh, formations that I always come back to is Urdu is home for Zarina. It's her mother tongue and it's a language that she really excavates in her practice um, as a space of belonging for her. It's right? something that she kind of takes with her even as she leaves the Indian subcontinent and constantly returns to. And so oftentimes in her work, you'll see her um, use, you know, she'll reference famous, um, she'll reference famous poets, Urdu poets. Um, she will, you know, reflecting on various poems. She will um, inscribe her maps with uh, the names of, um, of the Urdu names of um, the places that she's, she's looking at. Um, the last kind of print, for example, that I, you saw uh, dividing line paired with New York, that's actually accompanied with a Urdu inscription of New York. And there's a way in which, and scholars have looked at this, that um, Urdu actually becomes a material, just like paper for Zarina, something that she negotiates, something that she um, plays with, something that is, um, helps her think through, um, uh, think through borders on a different kind of level, right? So can language be a border is a question that I think she always raises. Um, so yes, it's something that we see her um, uh, really play with um, um, as, a, as a kind of border, as a kind of home um, throughout her practice. Thank you very much, Aparna. Yes. yes. Thank you so much, Aparna, for that beautiful presentation on Serena's Dividing Line, which has clearly been so important to you. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today to share more about the artwork and the narratives within. And thank you, Saloni, for helping us move through this program today.
And thank you to the 100 people who joined us today. This program has been recorded. It will be available immediately on our Facebook and in the coming days on our Instagram and on the Fowler website for you to revisit and share as you see fit. And we hope that you will join us for our next program coming up next month. Until then, we hope that you'll have a great day and a great week and we'll see you again next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Aparna. Good night. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>